Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, November 8th, 2020. Lesson 10, this is Lesson 10 in the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, and we are in Unit 3, which is entitled Godly Love Among Believers. Godly Love Among Believers. Our lesson title is The Love Connection. Our devotional reading comes from Psalm 80, verses 7 to 19. Our background scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 14 to 17. That is also our lesson text. And our key verse is uh, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. The lesson aims are, number one, comprehend how the metaphor of the vine and the branches applies to Jesus and those who follow him. Number two, yearn for a more intimate life-giving relationship with Jesus. And number three, commit to keeping Christ's commandment and so abide in his love. The, the lesson after the introduction has three major divisions. The first is abiding in Christ produces fruit. And that's covered between John chapter 15 verses 4 and 8. The second is love perfected. That's covered between verses 9 and 13. And the third is the basis of friendship. And that's covered between verses 14 and 17. For those who use the standard commentary, uh, that lesson title is Abiding Love. Abiding Love. And very quickly, additional aims or... Define how the vine slash branches metaphor describes our relationship with Christ, which is the same as the quarterly. Number two, connect love and obedience as complementary elements in the Christian life. Love and obedience. And then number, and we recall, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So uh, one is, one evidence is the other. And then Number three, identify ways to abide in Christ more faithfully. And that's the objective always of studying God's word. We study God's word that we might know his will, that we might increase our faith and be and, to, and do his will. Uh, we don't study it just to, to have a head knowledge of it, but we want to be faithful doers. We want to apply this word to our lives. So we're going to have a brief word of prayer. We're going to give a little background, and then we're going to get into our verse-by-verse discussion of this lesson. Father, we do thank and praise you again for this uh, this great opportunity, Lord, to study your precious word, your word which is life and spirit, which is life eternal, Lord, and spirit. And Lord, we pray that you would increase our faith as we understand your word. And that you would increase our obedience to your word, Lord, as we apply it to our lives, Lord, as we demonstrate our love through our obedience to you. Lord, we know that you know all that's going on in our world today, and we know that you are fully in control. And Lord, we just thank you for the peace that you've given us, even in the midst of these tumultuous times, Lord, the times of uh, this dread virus and pandemic, the times of the election um, Uh, all that's going on with the election, the national elections, Lord. And we pray that you would, uh, that you would, uh, your will would be done, Lord, through all of this, Lord. We pray for godly wisdom always for our leaders, Lord. We pray that your redeemed will say so, Lord, will speak out for righteousness and for truth. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless this nation, Lord, that you would bless us in every needed way. And certainly, Lord, with all those who are of the household of faith, Lord, we pray that you keep them in perfect peace as they keep their minds stayed on you. 
again, Lord, give us a clear understanding of this word and help us to apply it to our lives that we might be more faithful doers of your word and bring glory to your precious name. In, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, this, uh, our lesson text is a familiar passage for most of us. Uh, and it is in the <clears throat> the middle. Chapter 15 is the middle of Jesus' final um, discourses or teachings uh, to his disciples, the 12 that would become apostles, um, beginning in the upper room and, and going to the, the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and along the way, he is he's really uh, using the last few hours of his earthly life to uh, to compress into them, to 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 teach uh, into them the truths that they need to know, and and these truths that are taught in these, uh, uh, if you will, uh, messages between chapters thirteen and seventeen, or beginning ending at seventeen with his high priestly prayer for us, uh, are not covered in the other gospels, the synoptic gospels. Uh, so we're right in the middle of this series of, of, of teaching uh, uh, of, of uh, sermons, if you will, or messages that uh, Jesus is, is sharing with his uh, closest disciples at chapter 15. And if we back up to the first verse of chapter 15, uh, Jesus says, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are always, I'm sorry, he says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Those are the first three verses, and I, 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 I draw attention to them because Jesus declares himself as the true vine, and this is the last of, some say eight, uh, seven, I say eight I am statements that Jesus makes throughout the Gospel of uh, John. And uh, uh, when he says, I am the true vine, it suggests that there was a vine that perhaps was not true. And I went, I went, I'm not going to take a, a lot of time with this, but I would refer you to Isaiah chapter 5. And the first seven verses of Isaiah chapter 5, and I'm not going to read those, but please do read those. Uh, in those verses, uh, the Lord talks about uh, a vineyard that he had planted uh, and he had dug up and uh, cleared the ground, and he had planted it in a choice, with a, a, the choice vine, and he built a tower in the midst of it, and he made a wine press, and, and he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And that vine that he was speaking of then, God himself being the vine dresser in, back in Isaiah, was Israel. And Israel, the branches were corrupt. They they brought forth wild grapes, uh, unedible grapes. Uh, and so when Jesus declares himself as the true vine, it is in counter distinction to the the bad vine or the, the false vine, if you will, that God planted in Israel or as Israel. So I'm not going to, again, say any more about that, but let's go on and read our, our, uh, First division passage, which again is John 15, verses 4 to 8. And from the King James Version, it reads, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, Except it, by, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, 
and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So let's back up to verse 4. Um, Jesus instructs the 12, or in this case, the 11. Uh, perhaps uh, Judas has, I believe Judas has left at this point, uh, to betray the Lord. He says, abide in me and I in you. Um, the word translated from the Greek abide uh, really uh, is translated in many uh, different ways depending on the context. It can mean remain, it can mean continue, it can mean do well, uh, and uh, so we get the idea that it is something that uh, means to be steadfast in something. And he says, and I in you, in other words, let me abide in you or dwell in you or continue in you or remain in you. He says, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, Except ye abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Now, this this is a, a very interesting metaphor, which, of course, <clears throat> was very clearly understood by the people of Jesus' day. Uh, and just, just to make sure that we're clear, um, the... Vine was the stalk. It was the the trunk, if you will, that uh, uh, that bore the that that the roots bore and that sat on the roots uh, above the ground. Okay, and certainly it was nourished through the roots uh, with water and the nutrients from the soil. The branches were attached to the vine. And I don't know if any of you have ever visited any vineyards. I've had the opportunity to visit some in California and Italy and in Germany and uh, or at least see vineyards in those other countries. And during the, uh, the months when they are not uh, producing grapes, there's just, there is just the nub of the vine that's protruding above the ground. I mean, there's not much more than that. The, vine, the, the branches are all, uh, have all broken off. But when it's producing, the vines emanate from that, uh, the branches rather, emanate from the vine, and they are loaded with, um, with grapes. So what, what does it mean practically, to, practically rather to us to abide in Christ, Christ being the vine? It, it means to have a, a firm uh, and steadfast relationship with God, uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ rather. Uh, to abide in him means that we are being nourished by him through, through the Holy Spirit. And we will produce fruit. Uh, we'll get uh, to a further explanation of that in a few minutes. As we abide, uh, we cannot uh, do otherwise if we are truly abiding in him. Uh, we're staying steadfast and being nourished by uh, the true vine. Uh, and he says, he says, except it, he said, you cannot bear fruit of itself. So there's no way a branch apart from the vine can bear any fruit. Uh, one of the commentators, in fact, the uh, Faith Pathway Adult Correlator uh, gave a good analogy for our day. I mean, for those of us who are not uh, farmers or uh, uh, vineyards, 
or not uh, vine dressers, if you will, uh, of a lamp. A lamp uh, can illuminate a room uh, if it's plugged into a power source. If you pull the lamp cord from the receptacle, it goes dark. So the lamp cannot illuminate a room unless it is has power from a source of power. Uh, and Jesus is the source that of power that produces fruit in our lives. And we're going to talk about fruit, more specifically about what this fruit is that the vine produces. Let's move on to uh, verse 5. He says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, or that dwells or remains in me, that stays steadfast to me, and I in him, and allows me to be in him and work through him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Now, I, I want to say something that <clears throat> uh, about how this abiding naturally produces fruit. Uh, I've, I've made mention of this many times in, in different uh, teaching situations. Uh, this isn't something that we have to work really hard at. In fact, uh, we're not talking about uh, working at producing fruit, but working at our relationship with Christ, working at abiding with him and dwelling in him and allowing him to dwell in us and being nourished through his spirit uh, with all of Jesus's teachings, with his guidance, uh, with his power, the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, the fruit comes naturally. Uh, it is not that we work hard to produce fruit apart from uh, from the vine. If we are clinging to the vine steadfastly, the fruit will come naturally. And so he reminds them again, I'm the vine. Um, you are the branches that emanate from me. He says, he, and it's anyone that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit is productive and we're going to find out why it's productive and becomes even more productive in a few minutes but without me again he says you can do nothing a branch apart from the vine can do nothing but wither and die in fact from the moment it's severed from the vine it's dead already it's just it's just a case of then decaying drying up and decaying again remember <clears throat> The, the actual vine is nourished uh, by the roots, uh, which, again, draw nutrients and water from the soil. And, and then through it, the branches that split off from the vine are nourished. And the disciples uh, were to be connected, Jesus' followers, were to be intimately connected to the life-giving spiritual nourishment of Christ, of his leadership, of his guidance, of his word again. And this relationship, uh, if it's strong, as I said, the natural result, the spontaneous result will be the production of much fruit. Verse 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, this is a, a metaphor within the metaphor here. Uh, he's given the, the contrast. If you don't abide in the vine, then you will be removed from the vine, cast forth as a branch, and of course, as I, as I said, from the time that the branch is severed from the vine, it withers and dies. It's essentially dead already. It just dries up and withers. So what what does this mean? Um, well, not, not all branches coming out of the vine 
are productive um, and uh, and they, they and, and they're all not going to survive. He said some branches are damaged uh, in various ways or even dead and just hanging on uh, to the stalk, but they are producing nothing. Uh, and then others just don't produce fruit uh, in the growing season as they should. Uh, and they become uh, parasites and they suck uh, life-giving water and nutrients uh, from the vine and its roots. And these branches really have to be removed to make room, more room for the productive branches to be more fruitful. And uh, certainly um, when branches are severed from the vine, dead branches and they dry up, they are good for uh, for fuel, for fires. Uh, uh, and and a, a, this is what's, if we understand what's being said in this verse is, it says they're withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. This is not a fire for keeping the house warm, or hearth, or for cooking food over necessarily. This is a bonfire. This is just discarding waste, veget just waste vegetation. And it really uh, speaks of judgment. It's an image of the judgment that is going to come upon those who are disobedient, who are faithless, uh, and um, we can uh, read about this in Ezekiel chapter 19, verse 12, uh, Matthew uh, 13, verse 42, and Revelation uh, verse 20, I'm sorry, chapter 20, verse, verse 15. Uh, in fact, let's take a look at another one, uh, verse uh, Luke uh, 3 and 9. Now, Luke uh, 9, 3, 9, John the Baptist is preaching and he is talking about the judgment that is to come. Uh, and he's, he's really uh, talking to the scribes and the Pharisees and the, he called them a brood of vipers and who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Uh, and uh, see, they appear to be branches, uh, but they were false or unproductive branches that therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. This is verse eight. For I say unto you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And then verse nine reads, and even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So this speaks of the judgment that is <clears throat> going to befall those who are unproductive uh, servants or branches in the metaphor that we're um, we're discussing now from John 15. And again, this fire is not one that is used for cooking or for warming the house. It is a bonfire. It is judgment. Let's move on to verse 7. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Now, we're going to say more in a few minutes about what abiding um, also includes, and not it includes obedience, not just uh, being uh, willing to hear uh, the words of, of, of uh, the Lord Jesus, to know his will, uh, <clears throat> to trust him, to have faith, but it means to be obedient uh, as a demonstration of our love, certainly love and uh, faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But in, in verse 7, he says, if you abide, if you continue, if you dwell in me and my words, that's his will, abides in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done. Now, this can be understood as uh, asking for anything as long as we are abiding in Christ and his will 
is abiding in us. It mean, that, so that means we're going to ask for things that are consistent with his will. We're not going to ask for a new uh, a BMW or a, or a new larger house or something like that or anything selfish for our selfish consumption. We're going to ask for things that are consistent with his will. But I think more specifically, it is uh, applying to uh, ask for things that are needed to to be fruitful branches, okay? Uh, and, and we'll say more about this in a few minutes, but I think he says, well, you'll ask what you will. In fact, let's read that uh, from the NIV, uh, which I think might help us a little bit here. And, and verse 7 in the NIV, he says, you, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Well, again, uh, maybe that didn't add so much clarity, but I believe it's speaking in this context of asking what you will to enable you to be more productive fruit bearers. Now, we are allowing his word, we are to allow his word to dwell in us. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So we are to let God's word, uh, the Lord Jesus' word dwell in us and guide us, guide our actions, guide our attitudes, guide our thoughts, guide our praise that's what's being spoken of here. It means to have our thinking and our actions guided by the teaching of Christ. We could back up to John chapter 14, 14, where Jesus says, if you ask anything in his name, he will do it. And of course, that means anything that's consistent with his will. Uh, and we ask in his authority. We're not asking for anything and everything. Verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Now, um, we can see Jesus uh, really beginning to speak of the purpose for abiding, the purpose for bearing much fruit, and he does that in three ways. Um, first, uh, he says this faithful abiding and resulting obedience brings glory to the Father. When we abide in the vine, we're nourished by Jesus, we bring glory to the Father. Our actions reflect our Lord and our submission to him. And, uh, and of course, that brings glory to God. Second, Faithful abiding with uh, will bear much fruit, and uh, this might evidence the evidence of a godly life. Uh, but uh, as described by uh, the fruit of the spirit, which uh, Paul lists in Galatians chapter five, verses twenty-two to twenty-three. Let's just take a very quick look at those. So, uh, abiding in Christ is going to produce, again, this uh, godly life evidenced by the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And he says, against such there is no law. Now, and, and, I, and I, I know you, you've heard this said before. Uh, he doesn't say fruits as in a multiplicity, but fruit. Uh, you don't just have one of these if you're abiding in Christ. You don't just produce one of these. You produce all of these as a fruit and so <clears throat> that is what we're talking about uh, generally uh, in the course of our Christian life, in the course of our Christian walk. But we are also talking about 
reproducing in others' lives through by by witnessing to and bringing uh, new disciples to Christ, witnessing to unbelievers and bringing new disciples to Christ. And then the third way is um, Jesus um, is, is doing this is the core of being a disciple. Uh, we, you know, we, uh, we know we use that word disciple a lot uh, in the church, uh, but it basically means uh, student. Uh, and Jesus is our teacher from whom we learn everything we need to be his, uh, his disciples. And it isn't something that we, we outgrow. We never stop being disciples. You know, when you go to school, you have a teacher, and then you, you learn everything that teacher has to teach as you move to the next grade and so forth and so on. And then some get to the Ph.D. level where they become teachers, and uh, no one uh, is left to teach them. But does not that way with Christ. We are s- disciples as long as we are in this life. We are disciples for life. So now we're going to move to the second um, division of our lesson, which is entitled Love Perfected. And that's covered between John 15, verses 9 and 13. Uh, beginning at verse 9, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So let's back up to verse 9. And again it reads, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. And now Jesus is is moving beyond the the vine analogy to speak um, more directly about the relationship between his disciples and himself. And uh, and then, of course, this extends, is going to extend to them, the relationship between the disciples. Uh, and, and, he, and he begins with, with, the, with the fundamental uh, truth uh, about God's love. And Jesus testifies of the Father's love for him, and he does that throughout the book of, of John. You know, he says this love is demonstrated by the authority the Father gave the Son. We see that in John chapter 13, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 35. And the Father's revealing his plans to the Son. We see that in John chapter 5, verse 20. And look at these verses when you have time. And then also the Father also loves the Son for his willingness to give his life for sinners. We see that in John chapter 10, verse 17. We won't take time to go to those, but please look at those when you have time. And so, and then also uh, in, in the high priestly prayer that Jesus prays in John 17, in verse 24, he talks about the eternality of this love. This love has no ending. Uh, it, it, it's, it, the Father's love for the Son is eternal, just as his love is for us. So the, the Father's love for the Son is something that we, we is so incredible. We, we could not uh, ever understand that, I'm sure, but Jesus is, is, is trying to help us to understand that that same love as the Father has loved him, he has for us, for his disciples. And, uh, but uh, we need to, ex- but experiencing that love, realizing that love means that we need to continue in Jesus, to abide in Jesus, to abide so we can be the recipients of that great love, the full benefactors of it. 
Verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So here's a condition now for continuing to dwell in or be the recipients, the full recipients of the love of Christ, which is like the love that the Father has for the Son, and certainly for us as well. Uh, so he, he's, he's now connecting uh, command-keeping and love-abiding. Uh, uh, and, 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 and his disciples, uh, for the, them to ultimately, to realize again the ultimate love, then they must keep his commandments. And if we go back to... Uh, Chapter 14, uh, beginning in verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. And elsewhere, Jesus says, if you, and that's speaking of the Holy Spirit, he says, if you love me, uh, you keep my commandments and my father and I will make our abode in you or dwelling place in you. So Jesus, uh, the King James, I read from the new King James, but the King James also says, if it phrases that verse that I read, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So the way we demonstrate genuine love for the Lord Jesus Christ is by keeping his commandments, just as Jesus demonstrated his love for the Father by keeping his commandments. Um, and uh, I, I often think when, um, when people are up praying and declaring how much they love the Lord, uh, that if, if whether or not and they, that love is demonstrated by obedience to the Lord, that's the way we really we really uh, demonstrate our love, the Lord. So, and then, and in that verse again, verse ten, he says, "As he says, keep if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love." Now, we want to we want to be clear here: the very nature of God is to love, and Jesus is not keeping his commandments so the Father will love him. Jesus is keeping his commandments out of love for the Father and, and, and in response to the love of the Father. As we are to keep the commands of Jesus, the commands of the Lord, because of his love for us. We are not keeping the commandments so that he will love us, but in response to his love. We love him because he first loved us. Verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Now the commentator, one of the commentators says that loving God and therefore being obedient to him is not drudgery. It brings joy, a full lifetime of joy. And then he goes on to speak about the uh, how bizarre it was for Jesus to be speaking of joy uh, just hours away from what he was going to endure. Um, the, uh, of course, the, the betrayal, uh, the, the sense of abandonment by his uh, disciples, uh, the uh, brutal beatings and the, uh, the unfair trial, mock mockery of a trial a mockery of a trial and his uh, ultimate crucifixion uh, death by crucifixion so it seems a little um, a little bizarre that Jesus would be speaking of joy but but Jesus is looking on the other side of uh, this this passion what he is going to have to endure the sorrow that he is going to be temporary. He's looking at the great reward uh, that's going to uh, have uh, an endurance for eternity, an, etern an eternal reward that he's looking forward to. And as we are to, uh, we are going to uh, suffer 
we're going to have to endure uh, 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 trials for our faith, but we are to look beyond that to the, the joy that we will enjoy for eternity beyond this, the suffering that all who live godly for Christ will endure. Let's take a look at John chapter 16, uh, verses 20 to 22. This is from the New King James. Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, that ye will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and ye will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Verse 21, A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will be will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. So Jesus is speaking about that eternal joy that is to come. We're not going to have joy throughout this life. Now, we can have joy in the midst of our trial. James tells us in James chapter 1 to count it all joy when we suffer various trials and temptations. But our joy is not going to be full until we are at home with the Lord. Verse 12. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Now, we recall from uh, last week's lesson when Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples and he washes their feet and he gives them a new commandment and he introduces it in 13, John 13, 34. And he's in thir John 13, 35, he says, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another, even as I have loved you by this, shall all men know that ye are my disciples. And, and and not only did Jesus teach that we are to love, command that we are to love one another, but Paul also did in Romans chapter 12 and chapter 13 and, first, and Peter, uh, and also in Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, Peter, 1 Peter 1, 22. And, and so these disciples, these apostles, taught the same thing that Jesus did. Uh, one of the commentators said they had not read the Gospel of John because it had not been written in, but they learned from Jesus himself that first and foremost, we are to love one another. And this is a core element of being a Christian. Now, we know that non-Christians can love uh, others and uh, and be loved by others and can be loving persons but they have ulterior motives for doing so. The Christian is called to love even the unlovely person, to love their enemy as Christ loved those who were enemies of God. So while Jesus is commanding us in this verse to love one another, uh, that is not intended to just be fellow believers as God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son and, and that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He, he wants us to love even our enemies, those who are outside of the family of God uh, and those who despitefully use us. And in that way, we imitate him and his great love for us. Verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, again, uh, we're talking about love and the the imperative of love and what Jesus is declaring in this verse that there's no limit to the depth of that love or the extent of that love he's saying greater but but but, but the greatest expression of that love is that a man lay down his life for his friends that's all that you can that, that that's all that a person can give the when i said there's no extent the extent is the maximum and that is one's life. And of course, within a few hours, Jesus will demonstrate the extent of his life for his disciples and the world 
by laying down his life. He said, no man taketh my life of me. I lay it down. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it up again. He laid down his life for the sins of the world. Then he goes on in verse 14 to say, and, and let me just say this as well. Um, uh, John uh, was the only disciple that uh, died a, a na of natural causes, or, or so we, we understand from the historical accounts. Uh, according to church history and traditions, all the others in the room that Jesus is speaking to, the, the apostles, uh, would give their lives for Jesus and the church. And so they they really uh, gave the ultimate or made the ultimate expression of friendship by laying down their lives again for Christ or for the church. And so have other martyrs throughout the church age. Verse 14, ye are my friends if ye do, do whatsoever I command you. Now, we... we all know what a friend is. A friend is um, a person uh, uh, that we have deep feelings for. We're going to find out uh, in the next verse uh, how he can, he or she can be a confidant, someone that we share intimately with. And he and Jesus is declaring us to be his friends, and he's going to make a distinction between that and servants in the next verse. He says, if there's a qualifier here, you do whatever I command. So there's a relationship between our friendship with God and our obedience to him. He's commanded us to obey him. We demonstrate our love for him through our obedience to him. And, uh, you know, we are Jesus's friends motivated out of love to do what God requires of us. Verse 15, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Again, a friend is one who can be trusted with uh, uh, with. Uh, intimate details uh, with uh, an understanding of uh, the purposes and the will, in this case, of Jesus and God the Father. And uh, so Jesus is distinguishing them from the servant who is is, is typically not a confidant. He, 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 he really uh, does his job out of fear in, in many cases. Uh, 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 and his, 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 uh, he's doing whatever the master says, whether he understands why he's doing it or not, just out of blind obedience. Uh, friends are not like that. Uh, I, I was listening, I was watching, I and mean, I'll be very quick with this, I was watching uh, uh, his, History Channel the other night, and, and uh, they were talking about the revolution and how slaves became spies in the, in the British Army camps. Uh, because they were able to see plans and hear about uh, attack plans and so forth. And they were just totally disregarded uh, uh, as someone that really had no understanding or no knowledge or no concern about the affairs that the British Army was, oh, those uh, were, were planning in detail. Anyway, uh, the, the servant uh, is, is uh, often, as I said, operating out of blind obedience and not out of uh, friendship or loyalty even. But Jesus is uh, calling us friends and, 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 and he's saying because of that, he has shared with us what the Father has made known to him. The will of the Father has been shared with us because we are friends of Jesus. And we, we want to examine our, 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 our status with Jesus. We, we're not, you know, I know some, some people are offended by that, the fact that Jesus can be a friend. We're not talking about, you know, him being our co-pilot or anything like that. We're talking about being a genuine friend uh, who can 
uh, again, confide in us the will of the Father and, uh, and, 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 and who expects us out of love for him to be obedient to the will of the Father expressed by him. He said again, back in 14, you're my friends if you do whatever I command. And what does he command? He commands what the Father commands him. Verse 16, if you have not cho you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go to and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and whatever whatsoever ye shall ask of my Father in my name, he may give it to you. Again, we talked about the production of fruit. Again, he has chosen us. We didn't choose him. He ordained, and in this case, it doesn't mean to go through a ceremony or anything. It just refers to having been chosen for a position of responsibility. And that responsibility is to be fruit bearers. And we talked about the, the, the general fruit that's displayed in the faithful Christian life from Galatians 5, verses 22 and on. And we talked about more specifically the fruit of reproducing ourselves in the lives of other uh, other people in, in making them disciples. Jesus declared in that uh, great command that we are to go and make disciples. So that is the fruit that the Father wants us to do. And he wants us to do it to his glory. Uh, he says, whatever ye shall ask of, of the Father in my name, I, we, I may do it. And again, this is consistent with his will. And, and I think, again, for the express purpose of reproducing ourselves uh, in others uh, as disciples of Christ. And then verse 17, these things I command you that you love one another. So he circles back, commands us to love. And, and what we do is to be done out of love. Uh, our obedience it's dim our love rather is demonstrated through our obedience. So as he commands us, the motivating uh, factor or force uh, in being obedient to those commands should be our love for him. And again, we also demonstrate our love for him in that obedience. And that love for us is he, he wants us to love him as he's loved us to love others as he's loved us and the love that with which he's loved us was demonstrated in the greatest way possible and that is by him giving his life uh, him dying a sacrificial death for the sins of the world so I'm sorry we went long with this we pray that maybe you've understood this passage a little better than perhaps you did before so we will pray that uh, God will bless you and keep you until we meet again.